Greetings, and bienvenue, Midna crew. Thank you for returning to this broadcast. And welcome to new viewers joining us for the first time. If you like a video, then feel free to subscribe. Post spooky case stuff. Stories, game, book, movie recommendations, pictures, greens, anything. Just as long as it's spooky and K. This picture spooks me on God. However, the theater of World War II that I find the most disturbing would have to be the Pacific. More specifically, Okinawa. The amount of needless bullshit that happened during the fighting, such as the self-ends and killing of civilians, the horrid jungle environment and how brutal the Japanese were to fight would be hellish to live through. With such horrors, there was plenty of fuel to create impacts, which makes me wonder. How much supernatural evil still resides over 70 years later in these Pacific battlegrounds? Especially once you start getting to the civilians, there should be ghosts every inch of that place. I spent three years on Oki. Tons of ghost stories. All the regular military shit like ghostly sentries trying to stand watch for live men. But lots of J-horror tier stuff. Like an Air Force guy who murdered his wife and baby in Kadena housing in the 50s. Then after leaving the house vacant for years, another family was moved into the house. And then that guy murdered his wife and kid. So the house was demolished and the land remains bare but some genius built a childcare facility on the adjacent lot, and people there have reported ghostly kids for years. And over time, hundreds of small children have made imaginary friends with the same names as the murdered children. There's old bunkers all over where people committed mass self-end during and after the battle too. Some are sealed, but still have piles of bodies in them from civilians and soldiers who used grenades because there weren't enough guns or knives to go around. Many cases where Jap soldiers locked dozens of civilians in bunkers then threw grenades in and sealed the wounded inside to die. My wife's all into that stuff, but I'm meh. A couple years ago I was working in Iraq, training Iraqi soldiers at Ballad, and there was a huge rainstorm, like monsoon style, and we saw some shadows running around against some T-walls in one of the abandoned areas of the base near the old Joint Special Operations Command and State Department compounds, thinking it was some Kataib guys goofing around or probing our own outpost out there. Where I was working, we went hunting for them, chased the shadows into a compound with one building and only one way in and out. Doors were all chained shut and windows sealed with sandbags. Didn't find anyone and almost had my Iraqis mutiny when I tried to get them to clear it. This is something my great-grandpa told me about his time in service during World War II. Great-grandpa, native Swede, was serving with the Finns during World War II, right on the border to Russia often get sent out on scouting missions and such. Once during such a mission, he and his squad get into a firefight with what they assumed was Russian scouts. Firefight goes on for a while until they get hit by a freak snowstorm. Deepest winter on the Russo-Finn border is more or less Ragnarok on its own. Add a snowstorm to that and... Yeah, you get the picture. Great Grandpa and his men take this opportunity to bail and do so successfully, but end up getting lost in the process. According to him, it felt like they were walking for hours until finally they saw faint lights in the dark and raging weather. Their relief wasn't long-lived, though, when the figure that approached them from the light aimed his rifle at them and ordered them, in what Great Grandpa always described as exceptionally slurred Russian, to drop their weapons and surrender. Great Grandpa and his squad did so considering they were tired and almost out of ammo anyway. Another Russian takes their stuff and two more fellas lead them at gunpoint through their camp. Camp consisted of about two dozen snow-covered tents, some haphazardly made palisades and a couple of fading campfires. There were people huddled closely around all of the fires, all draped in thick gray wool coats and blankets, and the few that weren't by a fire were standing in the dark edges of camp keeping watch. Finally, they reach the bigger fire in camp and are told to sit and shut up, while one of the guards puts handcuffs and manacles on them and locks them. After this is done, the Russian who captured them looks at my great-grandpa and points to a man sitting opposite of him and says, This is Strelnik. Never sure about how the name was written. Strelnik never sleeps and he never blinks, so don't do anything stupid. Sure enough, underneath the thick blanket, coat, and slightly obscured by the rim of his helmet, great-grandpa could make out the fire reflecting off of the man's eyes. While the storm raged on in the background, Great-grandpa silently tried to stay awake, but after the day, he'd had he couldn't, and finally fell asleep. 
That morning he is awakened by one of his squad mates frantically rustling his chains trying to get them off. He shoots a glance at Strelnik who's still staring coldly at him. Squad mate, who's still trying to get the chains off suddenly shouts, Never mind them, they're all dead, just help me. After they get the chains off they investigate and sure enough every single Russian in that camp was dead, including two of Great Grandpa's men who froze to death during the night. They and the four guards that arrested them were the only ones even remotely fresh. The rest were ice pops, as Great Grandpa put it. After that, it's nothing interesting. They managed to get back to their post and report their night. Apparently, they had managed to wander away into Russian territory during the snowstorm. My Great Grandpa was a rock of a man. Nothing phased him except snow and the crackling of fire after that. When he'd come over and visit, we would have to put out our fireplace, otherwise he wouldn't come inside. And whenever it started snowing, he'd pull the blinds down and cry quietly. I'm a U.S. Army veteran, and this is a true story of events which occurred during my time stationed in Hawaii. I am writing it to the best of my memory of the occurrences. The exact address and community name have been omitted as it is not my intention to negatively impact the housing community where these events took place. I will start with how I arrived there to begin with. The story begins in late 2011. I had just completed basic training at Fort Jackson, South Carolina, and was living at Fort Eustis, Virginia. My wife Nicole lived in an apartment off base while I stayed on base during the week, finishing up my military job training at the Army Aviation Logistics School on base. I completed my training after several months and found out to my astonishment that the Army would be stationing me in Hawaii with the 25th Infantry Division. It was very short notice and there was little time to prepare, but luckily we didn't have a lot of stuff to move at the time. Nicole was a little stressed to move across the world on short notice especially never having lived so far from family and home, but she was also very excited at the thought of living in Hawaii of all places, as was I. Hawaii is an exciting place to be at any age, but Nicole and I were both in our early 20s and ready to hit the beach. Preparing to leave Virginia, we shipped out our furniture, took a road trip to visit some family and say goodbye. Then upon our return to Virginia, we shipped our car out as well. The Army provided us with one-way airline tickets to Oahu, Hawaii, and we were on our way. It seemed too good to be true. We had only seen Hawaii in postcards and on TV or in magazines. It was a place where rich old people went or couples went for a short honeymoon. It was hard to imagine what it was going to be like when we looked out the airplane window and saw Waikiki Beach, Diamond Head Volcano, and Pearl Harbor. I closed my eyes and slept. A long flight later, we finally heard the captain call over the intercom system that we were approaching Oahu. Minutes later, we arrived over Oahu during the daylight. It was unbelievable to see from the sky. The water was so clear and blue. We exited the plane. It was a little while before Christmas and it was in the 70s. We rented a car at the airport, checked into our hotel and started to drive around exploring Pearl Harbor and the rest of the island before heading back to our hotel for the night. I checked in at the Army base and began a long process of paperwork and immunizations, introductory briefings and so on. The process took multiple days and in a few days or a week I was done and heading to my new unit where I was assigned. My wife and I had found the perfect spot to call home, a decent sized rental in the town of Capolet, just down a short road from the beach. The neighborhood was peaceful, quiet and always well kept. All our personal property as well as our car arrived at the port in no time. We were soon set up and settled in. My unit was ramping up for a deployment to Kandahar, Afghanistan with lots of work and lots of training. I began spending very long days at the base and weeks at a time on another island for training drills. The long hours at the base also meant I had our only vehicle most of the day. My wife, being alone all day, finally decided to adopt two dogs from the ASPCA which was very nearby. In fact, it was within walking distance at the time. Our dogs are both pit bull mixes and despite the reputation of the breed, they are more friendly and loving than most dogs I've ever known. The dogs kept my wife company and kept her busy. She began to train them and take them for long walks at the beach. It helped to pass time during the long days I worked at the base and the many weeks at a time I spent away at training off the island. When I was home, we liked to spend our time together exploring the trails and other interesting places around the island. One day we started to explore the wooded area near our house. The surrounding area was called Barber's Point. We stumbled upon what seemed like sprawling flat level areas taken back by the vegetation. 
Upon walking around, one could barely make out the ground underfoot was actually closer to a parking lot than soil. Grass had simply shot up through the broken, aged, and cracking surface, which was once asphalt. We saw railroad tracks leading toward the beach with trees grown up through the wooden beams. The place had a very creepy feeling. It was still and silent, but you could almost sense that the place was once booming with hustling, bustling work crews and noisy equipment whirring and grinding. There was once a lot of motion here. A lot of work took place here, and it echoed with the voices of people long since past. Researching the area later that night, we discovered that this was a staging area for WW2 supplies to be used in island battles against the Japanese. It was used to prepare for battles like Iwo Jima, Okinawa and Tarawa in the bloody fight, to storm beaches and take heavily fortified positions on Japanese islands. We had heard about many haunted areas around the island and brushed it off as people trying to be interesting, but something about this place really made the hair on our necks stand up. There was an energy still present behind that silent breeze, motion far beyond the gentle silent sway of the grass. Although desolate, there was the feeling of many eyes upon us from all around when standing in that place. The Hawaiian locals seemed to have a real understanding of spiritual phenomena throughout the island and its sometimes bloody history. There were many stories about the night marchers, the long dead warriors who roamed the island. Ghostly drums and chanting have been heard on many occasions with no explanation as these ghostly groups pass through the night. Fascinated by these stories but bored at home one night, we decided to pull out our Ouija board and see if we could possibly contact a spirit on this ancient and historic island. Is there a spirit here who would like to communicate? We asked. The planchette moved to yes repeatedly. We asked, are you good or evil? At this point, the planchette moved to the image of the moon on the board. How did you die? We asked. At this question, the board spelled out a number. Just to make sure we weren't misreading, we asked again. It spelled out this same three-digit number over and over again every time we repeated the question, how did you die? Next, we asked, can you give us a sign if you are here? Suddenly, our floor lamp flickered on, illuminating the dark room like a flash and then turned back off immediately. All questions afterward only moved to the moon over and over again with each question we asked. Getting nowhere, we said goodbye and called it a night. Things were going great for a while, but as time went on, that all started to change. The dogs began to act strange in the house. Maybe they are just adjusting to life in our home, we thought. But as the days went by, their strange behavior turned to downright creepy behavior. One night, we awoke to the low sound of growling in the darkness, coming from the foot of the bed. I initially figured one of the dogs must be having a bad dream or hearing some off noises outside. With the light of my phone, I sat up and peered down to find one of the dogs sitting up tall, fully attentive, ears perked and eyes staring straight ahead into the darkened hallway. He was staring with such focus and intent that I could swear there was someone standing just outside the doorway looking back at him from the dark hall near our stairway. He appeared to be staring up as if looking into the face of this invisible entity. A quick check with my phone light revealed no one there. This behavior became a common occurrence at night. One night, I awoke to an especially horrible growling, this time at the left foot of the bed near the closet. I sat up and again, using the light of my phone, realized my dog was glaring straight up toward the attic door this time. The attic door was really just a wooden access panel on the ceiling of my walk-in closet. Birds. Maybe mice, I thought. I had to be up early, so I calmed the dog, petted him, and went back to sleep. Every weekday in the early mornings around 4.30 a.m., I would walk downstairs, start some coffee, and begin to get ready for morning exercises at the base. I always let the dogs outside while I got my bag packed and lunch ready. Once ready, I'd let the dogs in, lead them back up to the room, kiss my wife goodbye for the day, and head off to the base. The growling continued to occur from time to time until one weekday morning as usual I woke up at 4.30. The dogs stood up, yawning and stretched and shook off in excitement to go outside. I walked downstairs with the dogs following close behind me like always. We got to the bottom of the stairs, turned left and started down the hallway toward the dark living room when all of a sudden both dogs froze dead in their tracks on either side of me. I said, come on boys, let's go outside and patted my thigh three times but they didn't budge. They looked paralyzed with fear, staring at something across the room. I followed their gaze and it led straight into the darkened far corner of the living room. It was too dark to see anything, 
but I could feel a presence there in the shadows glaring back at me with an antagonistic and laser-like focus that sent chills down my spine. In a split second, both dogs turned and bolted for the stairs, frantically running up the hard steps with everything they had, paws slipping, claws scratching, and elbows knocking wood as they desperately tried to scramble back to the safety of the bedroom. I quickly flipped on the living room light and found myself staring straight into an empty corner. There was simply nothing there. As I prepared my lunch in the kitchen, I could feel something standing an inch behind me, staring blankly at the back of my head, like the dead breath of some sort of corpse making the hair on my neck tingle. It was an unnerving feeling, and I knew for the first time then and there that something definitely wasn't right. When I got back upstairs, the dogs were hiding under the bed, shaking. They absolutely refused to budge. Whatever they had seen in the living room had really scared them. As time went on, my wife began to experience terrifying sleep paralysis. My dog, Milo, who normally awoke us growling, was now glued to her bedside at night. He refused to move. He would no longer even leave the bedside to go outside in the mornings. Maintaining his position and guarding her as she slept, even standing guard outside the door any time she was in the bathroom. Despite all this, many nights she would awake in horror, unable to move her body or speak in any way. At the time, we did not fully attribute this to anything paranormal, but it soon became clear that there was a presence in that house, and it was focused directly on her. She started to get strange feelings like she was being peeked at from around corners or from dark rooms, like someone staring, looking out at her from the corners with only the smallest portion of one eye from the darkened rooms of the house or the stairwell. It seemed to happen more when I was not there or when she was distracted seeing shadows move out of the corner of her eye. The dogs would often be seen barking and growling at something or someone just out of sight, looking upward as if into the face of a person just around the corner. The paranormal activity intensified. I awoke to growling again one night as usual, but suddenly my eyes shot open and I sat up realizing that it was not a familiar growl. It was not coming from the doorway or foot of the bed this time. In fact, it was not a dog at all. It was clearly coming directly from the empty space between my wife's pillow and mine. It was unlike any dog growl. It was deep and demon-like. I knew something unseen was there. The next few days only brought worse. My wife filled the dog's food bowls for breakfast and set the bowls down on the floor of the dining room. A moment later, the bowl she had just set down flew across the room, hitting the wall with a metallic crash as dog food rained down onto the hard tile floor and the bowl noisily whirled to its final resting place upside down. I was past the point of fear of it and well into anger at it. We'd close our eyes to go to sleep. It was standing over us like a dark shadow. We'd close our eyes to wash our faces. It was breathing down our necks. We'd close our eyes to wash our hair in the shower. It was peeking in from the edge of the curtain. We would be talking while doing random tasks, such as washing our faces, and we would hear a metallic-like voice mimic us from a foot away. I'll turn on some warm water, I'd said one night while getting ready for bed. A second later, a robotic voice next to us simply said, warm water. I had it. Yeah, yeah, warm water. Shut up. I mocked it. This brought a new era of intensity. My wife was laying on the bed with the cat next to her when suddenly the cat stood us and went stiff, hair standing on end. The cat suddenly began freaking out and staring into the hall. She followed the cat's eyes and could see a large black mass come up the stairs sort of roam around the hall and then enter the bathroom outside our bedroom door. We started hearing blaring voice phenomena, the decibel levels of which nothing in our house was even mildly capable of producing. It was louder than a concert speaker and sounded like a distressed male voice yelling frantically through static at the top of his lungs, but we could never make out what he was saying. The first time we heard this, we literally ran outside and looked out expecting the whole neighborhood to be outside their houses scratching their heads and looking puzzled into the sky like we were. But nobody else seemed to hear it at all. Not even our neighbors who shared a wall. Impossible, it was unbelievable. This happened many times over. My dogs would freak out at this sudden noise. The intensity of it would cause us to grit our teeth and squint our eyes as we would nearly jump out of our skin because it was so sudden and deafeningly loud. How were the windows not shattering? The insanity with Nicole's sleep paralysis was still occurring as well. I sat near her while she drifted off to sleep on the couch one night. The dogs were sleeping. The lights were on. Suddenly I felt that old familiar presence again. I snapped my eyes up and there stood a shadow figure with red eyes against the wall behind my wife. 
Rage shot from me and straight into its face as it crouched and darted into my dark laundry room. I had finally seen it. This entity was a coward and wanted to creep around at night and then scamper away in fear when confronted. The next morning I made a point to walk downstairs without turning on a light. It likes to hide in the shadows. Well, I'm going to confront it in the safety of its little shadows. I will give it no space to hide, I thought. I immediately sensed it hiding, crouching in the furthest corner of the dark living room. I could sense its gaze, and I stared straight back, hoping to see its cowardly face. It scampered again to the dark laundry room as I power walked in, and for the last time ever saw this black, crouching figure against the far wall, curled up with its knees to its chest, sitting on the floor, cowering and staring up at me, as I were about to beat it. You are not welcome here, you are dead. Now get out, I said angrily with my stare burning a hole into it. I watched it sink backwards into the wall as if falling over the edge of a cliff. It did a backward somersault and was gone. After that, we never saw it again. My wife's sleep paralysis finally stopped. Our life slowly returned to normal and the dogs calmed down with time. We no longer live there, but I will never forget the strange and unexplained experiences of that house in Hawaii. Here's my short and closest spooky K story I have. Power goes out in the entire town for four days. The entire time it's monsoon level downpour. Just got some digital night vision for Christmas. Idea.jpg. Wonder my town at night. Super cool. Around 1200 live in the area according to the wiki. Get to the park. The layout is a tennis court and then basketball court. Playground behind them. Like any Midwestern town, we have a bunch of crackheads. They must have flocked to higher ground because there were like 20 to 30 all around. Now since my night vision is digital, it uses infrared lights. Not super bright, but you can see the red orbs. One noticed me. You have alerted the horde. All of them turn to face me when he yells. They start moving towards me. Get the hell out. Scared me real good. TLDR was a cryptid to some crackheads. I can post pics of the town if anyone wants them. Got pics of downed power lines. This is one of two experiences that I had while stationed at Hickam Air Force Base as a security specialist on the island of Oahu, Hawaii in the mid-90s. Uh, this incident would occur in 1997. The first day we were processed in, the other troops there started telling us new guys' ghost stories. I thought they were just messing with us until I had been there for a little while. It took all of one shift to start verifying the most prevalent story told on the base. It involves the 12th Air Force Headquarters building being haunted by the war dead of Pearl Harbor. The Pacific Air Force's Piakaf Command is also located in this building, so it is a very important place that requires strict security. There are manned security posts on the premises, as well as state-of-the-art laser and camera systems blanketing the property. As it should be. Anyway, a little historical background on the building. During the Japanese attacks on Pearl Harbor, the building was used as a hospital and temporary morgue. Over a thousand dead servicemen were stored there until their remains could be dealt with properly. Many of them would die in the building while being treated. There was so much blood that the cleanup required stringing of hoses throughout the building and washing the floors with scrub brushes. Pretty gruesome and for sure sets a good stage for some paranormal happenings. Well, the first night on shift, around 3 a.m., the motion alarms went nuts and the SRT, Special Response Team, was called to respond. I was training with the base patrol that night, so we went that way and provided backup. Every guy there seemed more tense than they should be. Something strange then happened to me. Instead of the SRT going in the building and clearing it, they simply reset the alarm and documented the occurrence. Anyone who knows anything about military security knows this is extremely unusual and not protocol. Well, when we returned to our patrol, I asked my FTO, field training officer, why? That just went down that way. This is what he told me. It happens every night, usually between 3 and 330. He also let me in on why there was a little shack outside the front door of the building instead of the guard being posted at the CQ desk in the lobby of HQ. Almost every airman that tried to work the post would refuse to stay in there because they would hear walking and inaudible talking, 
smell what was described as rotten meat or a slaughterhouse smell, and the stairs in front of that location would squeak and vibrate violently on a regular basis. I was still thinking that this was them messing with me. It just seemed like it was a little too scripted. Man, was I wrong! For the next six months I was there, this alarm thing would occur each and every night between 3 and 3.30, just like the sergeant said. I saw military working dogs refuse to go into search. Every dog would whimper, growl, and try to hide behind their handler. Those of you who know, know that military working dogs don't refuse service. I also witnessed grown men choose to sit on a stool in a 4x4 foot shack instead of at a nice desk in a spacious, air-conditioned lobby. I quickly became one of those guys in the shack. I experienced walking, talking, and stairs all in about the first hour of my first shift on that post. My shift on the HQ post began at midnight, and by 1 a.m. or so, my time of trying to stay at the CQ desk was over. I was pretty shaken. I never experienced the smells, but would experience the sounds on several occasions. Then at 3.17 a.m., the alarm went off. Motion detected in the basement and on the third floor. There had been nobody there since 5 p.m. when the building had been secured for the evening. Peculiar thing, very seldom did anyone come back in the evening to work there alone. I think I remember only about two times in my six months that anyone came back to work after 5 p.m. And they did not stay long. In and out, so to speak. These are my experiences at the HQ building on Hickam Air Force Base. I would be interested in knowing if there are any other former SF guys on this site who have had similar experiences while stationed there. It was creepy, and I experienced these things on several occasions, but the alarm thing was every morning without fail extremely unnerving place to work. The days off were great though. I was doing land navigation in Korea and there are multiple burial mounds throughout the area good for shooting points on the map. We were told to avoid walking on them if possible. We were doing nighttime iteration as I was walking. I heard someone talking quietly in Korean but to my knowledge all of our katusas, Korean augmentation to the United States Army, were gone. Katusa holiday. I was really soft but seemed to get closer but I had no idea what direction it was coming from and was seemingly right next to me and something sounded wrong in the voice like it was scared and or angry but soft. But nothing. Made me walk fast in a random direction and got pretty lost. Also swear I saw light in the direction of one of the mounds but it wasn't light from a flashlight like one of the other soldiers. It was like firelight and then completely disappeared. Someone else saw something like it apparently at one of the other sites like three clicks away that same night and mentioned it when we got back. I never told him I saw anything. I was and still am a military brat. My first paranormal encounters began with my earliest memories of my life at Quonset Point Naval Base. My father was a computer analyst programmer and as such we got to live on base in a mobile home park. Since my earliest memories were of mobile home parks, I always enjoyed sleeping with the sound of rain pitter pattering upon a metal roof. Now, I remember several odd things happening to me during the few years we lived in the mobile home park. So I think my memories were about the 1969 to 1973 years. As I remember kindergarten, along up to third grades there. I remember one time seeing an orange tabby cat sleeping curled up upon the couch in the living room. I approached it to take a closer look. I was curious about this cat because we didn't have an orange cat living with us. My memories are odd at this point because I recall that the cat seemed strange and that it had neither a head nor a tail, just a body. It struck me as being rather odd at the time. I could look at the cat with my eyes and yet not just with my eyes alone as I felt my eyes almost go cross-eyed looking down at it. After a couple of blinks, my mom asked me what I was doing. She was in the kitchen area. And when I answered her, I turned away and told her about the cat. When I turned back, it wasn't there anymore. Later on, I managed to capture a pet turtle. I really should have left it alone, but my dad indulged me and allowed me to bring it home. One time, one evening, I heard it scraping along the hallway from the living room to the bedrooms. Two, one master in the kids' room with bunk beds and the one bathroom. Dad told me to attend to the turtle before he got lost. I ignored it because I was at an interesting point in a comic book I was reading. 
The sound of the turtles scraping along stopped at that point. I thought at the time that it was due to the fact that all of the doors were closed and he had nowhere to go. I was wrong somehow. As soon as I got done with the comic book, I went to look for him. I couldn't find him anywhere. I searched several places over and over. I never did find him. All of the doors to the hallway were closed. I did not hear him scraping back down the hallway. Years later, my dad told me that when he moved the mobile home around 74 or 75, he found the turtle's shell underneath the house. No other bones other than its shell, and it were lying in the crawl space underneath that was completely inaccessible. No one was allowed to go in there, and I wouldn't do to all of the cobwebs. In short, there were no holes or such that would have allowed the turtle to crawl directly into the crawl space. The most significant event was the late night one. I remember it fairly well, even though it was nearly 40 years ago. I was in the top bunk, sis was in the bottom. Mom and dad were in the master bedroom and I had just woken up for no apparent reason. Something wasn't right about the house. Why I couldn't tell at the time. Then I heard footsteps near the front door, but it was more than just footsteps, I could sense it. I was lying on my right side and I could feel that my pajama tops were pushed up near my diaphragm. Again, I was always a restless sleeper. Lying there, I could hear Dad snoring in his bedroom and Sis was just snuffling a bit in her sleep. And there was someone in the living room slowly walking towards the bedrooms as if trying to keep from making any noises. But it couldn't prevent the slight depression its weight made upon the floor when it passed the wall between it and me. At which point I was definitely very nervous. I thought about yelling, but I just couldn't for some reason. Then the door to my bedroom opened. I could tell because I could feel the slight breeze generated by the door as it swung open upon my back. At this point I had my eyes firmly shut, due to the notion that whatever it was I simply must not look at it which would have been difficult since I was lying and facing the wall and not towards the door. Now at this point I could sense it. It was and still is difficult to describe. It was there and it had mass. I could feel it nearby only a foot or two away from me, yet I also felt that it was wrong. Some unnameable part of my senses told me that it was somehow less than it should be. Now as I lay there experiencing all of this, it moved. It put something upon my back. It felt like a wiener but cold and it stayed attached to my back. It had a sort of a sticky feel to it. I was a bit incensed at this so I decided I was going to shift over to my left side and open my eyes and then confront it which I proceeded to do. With my back touching the sheets along the way and definitely feeling something between me and the sheets right along my spine. I was nerving myself up to flinch, open my eyes and see it when I felt it tickling along my right side. I soon realized what it was, a hand trying to reach over and get whatever it was attached to my back. The hand felt feathery light as if it was trying very hard to not let it touch my skin. The number of fingers felt different too, like it did not have enough fingers or no thumb attached to its hand. I quickly lost my resolve to confront it at that point. After feeling it fumble after the attachment, I turned back onto my right side to give it ready access. At this point, my fear increased dramatically for some reason. I could almost feel its skeptical attitude about my being fully asleep. Finally, after what seemed too long, it reached out and took the thing from my back. I could feel some of my skin pulled out for a bit when it pulled it off. It pinched a bit. I was even more scared at that point as I suddenly realized I couldn't hear it breathing. There seemed to be some kind of residue that still clung to my back. It was placed along what would have been the bottom of my thoracic vertebra to near the top of my pelvis. Finally, after a while, I heard it stomp back the way it came in and exit the house. At that point, I was so exhausted that I fell asleep again. Naturally, I was met with complete and utter skepticism from mom and dad. I persisted with the notion that it was for real. At which point, my dad decided that I was no longer going to be allowed to watch some of my favorite TV shows, The Night Stalker, Outer Limits, and The Twilight Zone, which angered me to no end. That also taught me the importance of keeping my mouth shut amongst non-believers concerning my experiences of which I've had many more. I've had a lot of predictive dreams since then. I've had the occasional vision, a couple of UFO sightings, eerie feelings, and some truly incredible hunches. For the longest time in high school, I annoyed my family and friends by saying hello Anon whenever they called, and invariably I was right. This was long before caller ID. Now I've been in the military since then. Air Force for me and I got to enjoy survival training for combat communication school. Therein I got to enjoy sleep deprivation to the point of hallucinating. In retrospect, my childhood night terror was not a hallucination. I hope that you enjoyed tonight's broadcast.
If you enjoyed tonight's story, then please subscribe to the channel as more green texts will appear daily. A new broadcast will appear when the clock strikes. Midnight Central Time. Remember to check the Odyssey and Rumble pages for separate archives of previous broadcasts.